and, and this is what the scripture says. It says that the festival of unleavened bread, which is called Passover, was drawing near. And the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to put him to death. Do you know who he's trying to put to death? Jesus. Uh, because they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas. I want you to actually underline that because um, the fact that Satan entered Judas, meaning that there was a doorway or an opportunity for him to do that. All right, then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. How is it possible that someone who is chosen, appointed, gifted, has walked with Jesus, how could Satan enter him? Uh, I'll tell you in a little while, so just get ready for that. But number, verse number four, he went away and he discussed with the chief priest and temple police how he could hand him over to them. They were glad and they agreed to give him silver. So he accepted the offer and started looking for a good opportunity to betray him to them when the crowd was not even or ever present. Verse 7 says, Then the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover meal for us so that we can eat it. Verse 9, Well, where do you want us to prepare it? They asked him. Listen, he said to them. When you've entered the city, you'll find a man carrying a water jug who will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Tell the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover with my disciples? Verse 12, then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparation there. Verse 13, so they went and they found it just as he had told them. And they prepared what? When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles were there with him. And then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. We're going to pause right there, and as you're being seated, I want you to think about this in your heart. A seat at the table. That God prepares a seat for you at the table. If I asked you the question, how many of you would like to be seated at the master's table? Um, if I asked you to raise your hand, is there anyone that would say, I want to be seated at the master's table? You know, I remember just, I shared this at our first campus, that around Thanksgiving, which is coming up, you know, in my house, we always used to have a lot of people. So we had a decent-sized family, but we always used to invite folks over. And there wasn't one table that was big enough to fit everybody. So you know what happened when you were a little bit younger. Who knows what happened when you were a little bit younger? You had to sit at the kids' table. Like the adult table had the fancy silverware and the goblets and the champagne glasses. They had a little bit of gray papon on there. They had everything that wanted... Then there was the kids' table, which had that little plastic covering, and you had um, disposable forks. And did anyone know what I'm talking about? And I remember that when I was younger, I, I couldn't wait to get to sit at the, the big table. You know, I was excited about those moments, like, like, well, at the point where I felt like I'm grown now. I get to sit at the kids' table. And, and usually that worked, but every once in a while, even though I was grown, a new person would come, sometimes someone unexpected, and all of a sudden, once again, I get demoted to the kid's table. Yeah, I'm like a, I'm, I'm 18, 19, and, and there's kids around me, seven, eight, throwing things. It was, it, was, it was frustrating. But there's one thing that I realized as I got older, that no matter what table or what position you were on, you still got to eat. 
And I think sometimes in the house of God, we're so consumed about the place of preference. And so even the term, uh, a seat at the table, is, is one of the things in, that people often say when they want a place of influence. Uh, so so there, there are young folks that say, I want a seat at the table. That there are people that have been serving in ministry. I want a seat at the table. I, I, I want a place of authority, of, 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 of notoriety or notability. But, but I believe that God is just saying, hey, listen, the fact that I invite you is enough. Whether you are just a, a cupbearer in my house, it's enough. If you only get to uh, um, vacuum the floor in the house, it's enough. But because I, I've given you a seat at the table. And so Jesus actually set this model and example. And, and communion really is where Jesus said, I'm giving you a seat at the table. There are a few things I want you to ask yourself before you're seated. Because even though the invitation is being made, I believe that we should actually ask some things of ourselves. Let's not be so presumptuous that just because we have breath and life and just because God loves us that we should not be held to a level of accountability. I do believe God's children should act a certain way. I do believe that because you love God, it affects the way how you treat people. I believe that people of God should treat people better. Because they know who their father is. And so Jesus, this is the Lord's Supper, and he was, very, he was very much aware that this was the final moments of his life. And he invited people, people that he knew was going to betray him, to sit at the table. See, there's another part of scripture where he breaks bread and he blesses it and if you remember he he did that when the 5,000 were following and he took the fishes and the loaves and he broke it and he shared it uh, but but he didn't have communion with them because there's a difference between followers and faithful there's a difference between followers and friends or rather followers and family um, if we use the social media uh, um, Concept. You can have a lot of followers, but doesn't any of them are your friends. So he knew that he wanted to have this time of fellowship with who? His friends, his, his family, his 12. And so he invited them to sit down at the table. When God invites us to the table of opportunity, he's asking us to share in some deeper moments of intimacy where he requires, someone say he requires, that there's three things that we look within ourselves and do. So that we look within and we first check our attitude. What's your attitude towards him? What's your attitude towards serving? What's your attitude towards doing the things that you don't want to do, that you don't like to do? What's the attitude towards your spouse, towards your neighbor? That before you sit down in this presence, you need to first check your attitude. Because just because he gives you the invitation doesn't mean that there isn't a requirements that you should go through a process before you sit down and sit with the master, the king of kings, lord of lords, who, whose glory is going to fill the room. You, you don't think you have to do anything? You don't think you have to ask yourself any questions? Like you could just sit down any old how? Yeah, I remember. I mean, being invited to, it was a black tie dinner. And the reason why I was invited was because there was an extra seat. I was already at work. I was working for them. A nonprofit, and they say, "Hey, do you want to come to the dinner?" Um, and my first instinct was like, "Yeah, sure." But then I looked down at myself. I was like, "Oh man, what did I just say?" I remember during my break, I I went over to Century Twenty One. This was downtown because I needed to change my, my my outfit because I was invited to sit at the table, like the tables with with heads of state and some. Other things, I mean, this it was an expensive dinner. People would spend $2,500 a seat. 
tea salad. <laughs> Isn't that something? But I had to go through the process of checking myself. I, I had to go in the mirror. I had to say, well, what do, do, I, do, do I look the part? Do, do I fit in? Because even though the invitation didn't cost me anything, my attitude should make me feel like I belong in the room. So I believe one of the things that we need to do is just check our attitudes, but I also think we need to also check our actions. Because if we check our attitude and say our attitudes and motives are pure, but if our actions don't seem to measure up, then there's something wrong with the root. In other words, examine the fruit. And if something's wrong, then there's something wrong with the root. Because fruit will always project whatever was buried. So you'll never be able to bear fruit unless you deal with the root. If, you, if your fruit is sour, if your attitude is sour, then that means there's something deep down within you that needs to be corrected to deal with the root. And so when, when, when God invites you to be seated, check your attitude. Check your actions. And the final thing I want you to be mindful of, what you need to check or examine, is to check your affections. Check your heart posture. Check is your love really what it says it is. Check, check your affections. What are the things that you desire? Are you desiring to be seated because of the level of the king? Are you desired so that you can now be in the same frame shot as him? Or is your desire to be seated so that he still gets all the glory? Like what, what's, what do you love? Do you love the, the fame or do you love the father? Do, do you love the position of the stage or do you love the posture that it requires? See, some of us are not happy unless we are seated at the head. While yet others are ecstatic just being in the room. It, it kind of reminds me of the, the, the woman with the alabaster box. And, and, and let me tell you something. What she did has been spoken about thousands of years later because she, she, she just somehow got into the room. And she didn't come empty-handed. She came with something. And she wasn't even concerned about sitting at the table she said well even i can just get behind where jesus is see he's at the table I, I, i'm not even seated at the table but I, I, there's something that i want to give to him so 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 she does that <laughs> as we sit down we have to make a perspective shift because the invitation that god gives is to everyone in fact, scripture, the psalmist says he prepares the table before you. But before you sit down, you've got to ask yourself those three questions. So we see Judas is seated in the same picture frame as the Savior. But he exchanged one table for another. He exchanged the table of poverty for the table of seeming wealth. He, he, he exchanged the table of um, sacrifice for the table of self-celebration. And in the end, we can see that, he, that none of that satisfied him because even after he betrayed his, his friend, he realized that he was emptier than he's ever been. And I wonder this, you know, first lady, um, knowing that Judas would betray him, why would Jesus like, give him, why would, he, why would he let him sit down next to him and why would he serve, why? And then I started to think about myself and said, why would he let me? 
Why would he let you? Truth is, I'm not perfect. Truth is, you're not perfect either. Why would he let you partake in the community of faith? Because he loves you. Because he died for you. And so in the text we see how Judas was in the same frame or positioned in a level of, I would say, almost seniority. Because he says that this very hour... um, well, one thing he said to Peter, but he says, the person who dips his hand with me, which would mean proximity. So proximity doesn't mean that you have his presence. Being in the room doesn't mean that you experience his fullness. Because if your heart posture isn't in the right place, it doesn't matter where you sit on the table. You'll still get up leaving hungry. But if your posture is right, and the woman says it, that even the dogs can get the scraps from the table. Because if your posture is right, even if you're not seated at the table, then even the scraps that fall from the glory of the heavens, you still still shall be full. Somebody say amen. And so I believe that your posture positions you for purpose and not just your proximity. Because you can be around anointed people for all your life and still Go to hell. So we think about communion because he felt that it was so important that in these last moments that he would take bread and he would take wine and, and that he would break the bread, he would give thanks and he would share it. He, and, he, and he says that as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It, it was important that he was sharing this with his friends. And, and what is it? Is it? Is it the only time we have community? Is it going to be when we do communion Sunday? So, so this is what I believe. We weren't made for communion. Communion was made for us. So in other words, so, so the word communion actually, it means sharing. And every time we get to come into the house of the Lord, the Lord is asking you to share, is asking you to be a part of community. And so what we do, this physical act of breaking bread should almost be the rarity, but what we do every week when we gather together on a Sunday as family together coming, we should be breaking and sharing and, and exact checking ourselves and checking our attitude and checking our affections and checking our actions. That, that's, in fact, that's what you should be doing every morning. Because every morning that you have the opportunity to open your eyelids and to see the heavens, God is asking for a community. He's asking for covenant. So community is less about the frequency of the wine, the bread, but it's more about the consistency of your commitment to covenant. But, but once you're seated and once you've done those three things, I, uh, I would challenge you that this is what you're able to do. You're now able to look to him as your creator. Nehemiah 9 verse 6 says, you alone are the Lord, you made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them and the heavenly host bows before you. See, once you're seated, you now have a different perspective. It's different. You start to see things different, see others. You you see problems differently. In fact, you're, you're... Language changes. Problems now becomes opportunities. In fact, you start to get excited on some difficult days because you just start to say, well, the God who created the universe is able to move and shift and change it. I believe that with all my heart because your posture is different. You're not trying to get on the platform. You're just trying to get into his presence. And so when you're in his presence, there's fullness of joy when you 
at his right hand, there is joy forevermore. Mm. But as you are seated and you look to him as your creator, you can also look to him as your salvation. Because you understand that salvation comes to no other man except through the Son of God. And in fact, the writer writes this as the Lord is my light and my what? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. In whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemy, what? Rises against me to eat of my flesh. They will stumble and fall because the Lord is my salvation. So when I'm in difficulty, I have the right posture. I, I, I don't have to worry. I don't even have to get up out of my seat. In, in fact, I, I, maybe it's even presumptuous, but I say, Lord, could you please pass the victory? Because I'm seated at the table. And, and, and the, the writer also says that, that he prepares the table in the presence of my <laughs> So in the presence of enemies, wickedness, darkness, so forth, he prepares the table. What is the table for? For you to be seated. And I think sometimes if we would sit down more, we would watch God work more. But because we're so busy trying to do what God is designed to do, we find ourselves fighting battles we were never meant to fight. I believe that difficulty, when it happens, is that's a moment for the saints of God to sit down, to have the right posture, to go before the Lord, to go into praise, and so forth. We worry too much about what we have no control of. I'm, I'm preaching to somebody, even if it's, even maybe it's just to myself. But, but, but besides that, as we are seated and we look to him, we can also now understand that righteousness only comes through him. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy. And he freed us from sin. Righteousness cannot happen outside of who he is. No man can make themselves right only when they're seated at the presence of the table of God. Can you receive the full righteousness of the Father? What happened in this passage was, was baffling because not only did he serve this and did he invite unqualified, undignified people to be seated with him. And to serve a meal, I'll tell you the most intimate thing that you could do with someone is to actually serve a meal and have dinner with them. If you ever get invited to have dinner with someone, you know, that's, that's an invitation, especially if it's in their home. And Jesus did that because he, he said that I, I want to have communion with them. But what happened next is that as, he, as they were seated, he took a towel, took a basin of water. And he did what only slaves should do, and he, and he washed their feet. Why would a holy God wash our unholy feet? Because the feet represents the level of humility. It was the same feet that when God spoke to Moses, take off thy sandals because the place where you stand is holy. I don't just want your mind. I want your feet. I don't just want your heart. I want your feet because your feet are directional. And if I could figure, if I could point your feet in the right direction, then, then, then guess what? Then even when things are happening, you'll know where to go because you, I have you seated at my table. But, but if I can get your feet, if I can get your direction, if I can get your will, then... And purpose shall be established in your life, not just for today, but for ever. Because if your feet are planted in the right place, amongst the right people, in the right church, you will be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Even where you are, would you be seated with your heads bowed? Would you imagine that Jesus pulled a chair out just for you and he told you to be seated? That you were just in the room and maybe it wasn't the best seat. Maybe you're sitting on a wobbly stool that needs a
piece of paper underneath for it to keep level. Maybe you don't have a chair at all, but you're just, he, he invited you to be in his presence. The God of the heavens. Before the beginning of time, with no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath the planets form if the stars were made to worship so alive i can see your heart and everything you made Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praise, a soul will lie. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your voice. Mm -hmm. And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath. Evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, a canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you so 